Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight for the monthly public lecture. My name is Mitch Adelson, and I will be your host and moderator today. Before I introduce our speakers, I have a couple of announcements to make. First, we have a very interesting lecture next month. Mike Poland, scientist in charge of Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, will give his talk entitled, Busting Myths About One of the Largest Volcanic Systems in the World, The Top 10 Misconceptions About Yellowstone Volcanism. So please join us on November 18th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Pacific time for that talk. Towards the end of the lecture, we will open it up to question and answer session. If you have a question for the speakers, you can submit them through the Q&A chat window. To find the Q&A chat window, look for the question mark icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. This will bring out the Q&A panel where you can type in your questions. Please understand that we may not have time to answer all your questions, and we appreciate you understanding that in advance. And now it's time to introduce you to our speakers. Tonight, we have two speakers, Laura Thompson and Abigail Lynch from the USGS National Climatic Adaptation Center. They will talk about zombie salmon and ghost moose, the spooky implications of climate change. Abigail Lynch is a research fish biologist with the US Geological Survey's National Climatic Adaptation Center. Abby conducts science and science synthesis on the impacts of global change to inland fish fishes at local, national, and global scales. While Abby enjoys Halloween, she's not a great fan of scary rides. Much to her parents' chagrin, she once almost refused to go on the Haunted Mansion ride at Disney. Laura Thompson is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climatic Adaptation Center. She focuses on climate change vulnerability of species, particularly big game, and works with practitioners to respond to, to potential impacts. Unlike Abby, Laura loved the Haunted Mansion. However, years later, she almost bit off her fist while writing The Tower of Terror. And with that, Abby, the floor is all yours. Great. Um, well, thanks all for the opportunity to present to you this evening. And as you can see, we, we are taking the Halloween theme here quite seriously, um, but mostly we do want to share with you some work from our program uh, at the within the Climate Adaptation Science Center network. And um, as I couldn't find a way to work in my very favorite Halloween movie, Hocus Pocus, um, into our presentation this evening, you'll just have to settle for be wearing a witch hat for the first half of the talk. Um, so to get things started um, and set the stage for our presentation today, we are really going to try and run with this Halloween theme tonight. So, so get ready. Um, the premise of our presentation will be that the, oops, let's see here. Um, the, the National Climate Adaptation Science Center works to help avoid some scary scenarios for fish wildlife and um, related organisms, such as being chased by uh, Jack here. And um, ending up like this zombie fish is one of those scary scenarios that, that we really want to try to avoid. Um, so I'm going to run through a quick tool to show you how we can look at summarizing the impacts to help with research, planning, and adapt adaptation um, for the future. And then on the wildlife side, Laura is going to run through, um, a, 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 is going to showcase um, kind of how to uh, examine this, this poor ghost moose um, who is haunted by ticks in warming winters. And, and Laura will run through that example shortly. And then to, to end, we'll, we'll hopefully try to conclude on a brighter note looking towards adaptation planning for the future. Um, so first, uh, just a bit of background on our program. We are the um, with the US Geological Survey's Climate Adaptation Science Centers. Um, our mission is to deliver science to help fish, wildlife, water, land, and people adapt to a changing climate 
and our focus is on adapt impacts and adaptation. So this essentially amounts to helping managers protect our public lands and natural resources, uh, collaborating with tribes and indigenous communities to prepare for climate risks, and educating and training the next generation of scientists. Um, there are nine regional adaptation science centers and one national center within our network. Uh, these are federal university partnerships with a federal director and a university lead, and they're often consortium based. Um, we are a uh, partnership driven program that teams uh, scientists with uh, with um, natural and cultural resource managers and other local communities to help fish, wildlife, waters, and lands across the country adapt to changing conditions. Both Laura and I uh, work at the National Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is based at USGS headquarters out of Reston, Virginia. Um, our, our center serves as the national office for the CASC network and provides leadership and guidance on administration partnerships information management and communication. And um, in addition to its kind of management capacities, our center also conducts research on cross regional and national science priorities. So um, this is where Laura and I fit in. Uh, we're the, the lead terrestrial and aquatic research scientists at the National Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and as, as we mentioned, Laura is a research ecologist and she focuses on the responses of terrestrial species to changes in climate. And um, she, her research really works with the management community um, to provide science-based information to assist with decision-making regarding adaptation options. And she's also known to uh, step out every now and again as a, as a flapper on All Hallows' Eve and among her favorite companions when she does is uh, Merlin and Buzz as, as pictured here. And um, I'm a research fish biologist, and so um, as, as Mitch mentioned, I, I connect science and science synthesis on the impacts of global change on inland fishes, and my work really aims to inform conservation and sustainable use and assist fishers, managers, and other practitioners adapt to change. Um, and again, keeping with the Halloween theme, um, this is one of my costumes back from grad school um, where I went as the Sun Maid Raisin Girl and um, my now husband went as the Jolly Green Giant. And um, it was actually pr pretty fun. We went as a whole group themed costume where uh, a lot of us went as either food or, or product related characters. So you might see um, Snap, Crackle and Pop in the back there or maybe the Brawny Towel Man. Um, or Captain Morgan or the Honey Nut Cheerios be in the front uh, and among all the other costumes. So um, starting with the, with the fish side of our, our talk, I'd, um, I'd say that chances are when people think of scary fish, Jaws might be what comes to mind. Um, but my work is actually more on the side of thinking what might be scary for fish uh, from a climate change angle and mostly from a freshwater perspective. So this indelible image of a shark doesn't really quite apply to my work. Um, in my line of work, I'm more interested in, in something like this zombie salmon. And so salmon have a pretty fascinating life cycle where they hatch in fresh waters and make their way downstream and spend most of their lives out in the ocean. Uh, but then they have this innate drive to come back to the exact same streams where they are hatched and spawn and die. And if you've ever had an opportunity to see a spawning run in action, um, they're, they're pretty amazing uh, feats of nature. And sometimes these, these salmon who haven't eaten since they entered fresh water do look pretty battered up and kind of like a, a zombie swimming. Um, they are basically dead fish swimming once they've spawned. And it is quite common to still see them swimming around um, without their eyeballs and part of their, their flesh uh, being um, falling off their bodies, kind of very much like a zombie. And um, I'm not really sure why it happens, but often birds will will preferentially pick up their eyeballs. And so I'm not sure if that's because the eyes are more nutritious or maybe they're just easy, easier to to pick out. But um, but yeah, they really do look like zombie fish. And so um, while these salmon do die naturally after spawning, 
um, they can carry multiple infections that are, can be accelerated with warming waters. And these infections can actually affect how long the salmon can survive and um, uh, by consequence, their reproductive fitness, meaning how many offspring they can ultimately have. So um, this disease kind of consequence is what we would call an emergent property. And um, these are just kind of the ecological components of a community, which include the connections and interactions among species and assemblages that when viewed all together are, are more than the sum of their parts. And so this concept of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts is something that we're all generally quite familiar with, but um, these holistic properties of aquatic communities are often hard to predict when you just study the individual attributes in isolation. So while climate change may not necessarily manifest like the day after tomorrow, um, we do still wonder what will happen to these emergent properties because of it. And um, while we know it can modify these properties and kind of reshuffle species and communities across the aquatic landscapes, changing species distributions, um, their ranges, phenology, which means uh, essentially the timing of key life history traits and events, um, among other kind of population dynamics. And so we also know that freshwater systems are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Um, freshwater ecosystems make up just about 1% of the planet's surface, but they're home to about a third of all vertebrate species and about 10% of all species. And since 1973, um, freshwater biodiversity has really dropped by uh, over 80%, and, all, and this is a result of climate change and other anthropogenic stresses. And so I kind of feel like we're at the part of the movie Signs where we know something is wrong and we know something is coming, but we still don't know what to do about it other than maybe put a foil um, cap on our heads. And um, it can feel overwhelming in that we see climate change on the horizon, but we don't necessarily feel like we have enough information to help aquatic systems to adapt. And so right now I'm going to run very briefly to um, through a tool that we've developed at USGS to give a bit more agency to researchers and um, students and, and managers to help inform decisions uh, related to natural resource management. And uh, especially because um, natural resource managers do have to manage fish populations regardless of whether or not they can do it in a science based way. Um, as much as we don't like to, to think about that in that context. And so um, this all kind of started when we were getting um, queries and requests from people within our Climate Adaptation Science Center network and also from other colleagues and students. Um, everyone was wondering if we had any resources to help answer these questions about climate impacts to freshwater systems, and we realized that we could make our work uh, much more accessible to help others with their, their, their needs. And so um, we developed what we call the Fish and Climate Change Database, uh, or FICLI for, for shorthand. Um, this project began back in about 2014 with the aim to conduct an assessment on the impacts of climate change on freshwater fishes. And we, we set the sidebars that we only wanted to examine first documented impacts on North American freshwater fish. And then we expanded the scope to also include um, global studies and projected responses. Um, we did. We have done this as a systematic literature review and have compiled it into a publicly searchable database. And so um, systematic literature reviews are, are a model that is used quite frequently in the medical field. And while Rosemary's baby may have been an extremely special case, uh, pregnant women and other vulnerable human populations are often not subject to medical experiments for ethical reasons, but doctors can still use existing data and synthesis and meta-analysis to assist with making informed health decisions even for these most vulnerable groups. Um, similarly, we can apply the same sort of logic for ecologically vulnerable and understudied groups, and we could use data, synthesis, and meta-analysis to assist with climate adaptation and conservation and sustainable management, for example, for freshwater systems. 
um, again, because management decisions are going to be made regardless of whether or not the information, more information is available or not. So, um, so to our knowledge, FICLI is the most comprehensive global data set of detailed information on documented and projected impacts of climate change on freshwater fish that's extracted from the peer-reviewed literature in English published between 1985 and 2020. The database can be filtered uh, 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 in a number of different ways um, based on taxonomic or biological or physical or ecological information or even on um, geographic parameters, um, including also different climate change response types. And this is just a very quick summary of all the responses in FICLI by the different um, category types. And um, users can uh, define specific queries for increasing specificity and thickly uh, for the output to provide kind of the most relevant information you can to address management relevant questions. But beyond just compiling these studies, we wanted to uh, also provide additional summary tools um, to assist with these uh, use making the usability of, of this data set for others. So just to run through a, a few quick summary stats for across the FICLI database, um, there are 843 studies currently in FICLI. These represent uh, 58 different fish families. There are 392 focal species or subspecies or assemblages that are um, present in the database. And this is across um, over 1400 responses. And these can be parsed into a number of different categories. And this is just a, a handful of the different management um, recommendations that are affiliated with those different climate change studies. So um, once you filter the database as you, as you want, there are a bunch of different output tabs and options to download tables with all of the information from the different studies. And um, you can parse things out by different management recommendations with a interactive decision tree. And then one of the new features that, that we're looking to release with our next update um, is a confidence metrics tab where you, users can kind of select their own evidence threshold and it can dynamically display their filtered papers by response type. And you can indicate or, or it'll show if there's high, medium or low agreement among the different studies with robust medium or limited evidence. And we're just starting to scratch the surface really with all of these analytical capabilities with this, this broad data set and, and expanding each year. And um, the opportunities are really exciting because we see this fitting into a number of upcoming assessment processes such as the National Climate Assessment. And this is just one example um, showing a preliminary graph of the top 20 species in the database that are plotted by the proportion of positive responses to climate change, um, with the size of the bubble being the number of responses present in FICLI, and the color coding being um, related to the thermal preferences for the species. And so uh, just looking at this at a very coarse scale, um, the, the warm water species are all shown kind of in the upper right of the graph and um, that you can roughly equate to being uh, that the warm water species are likely to have more positive responses to climate change than the cool and colder water species. And um, lastly, just to end here, I wanted to flag one more communication related tool that we have related to this database. Um, thanks to some other colleagues at USGS, Sarah Burton and Jordan Bush, we've recently released a USGS story map on FICLI. And these are just some screenshots that that will um, th that show the features, but everything is fully interactive when you go to the website. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Laura. Thank you, Abby. I think I'm sharing here. Um, OK, so now we're going to move on and talk about the ghost moose. Sorry, just a second. here. OK, yep. Okay. Yep, so now we're going to go ahead and talk about the ghost moose. Um, 
So just to give you a little bit of background on moose in general, most people are probably familiar with this species. It's a large bodied organism that's found in northern portions of North America, typically where temperatures don't exceed 75 degrees for long periods of time. They are also found in close proximity to wetlands and also um, uh, a mixture of old growth forests with older trees that provide cover, but then early successional habitat or um, kind of open areas that provide um, growth and uh, vegetation that's optimal for forage. This map shows the um, distribution of moose throughout North America. And you may notice that uh, the majority of the range occurs in Canada and Alaska. In the contiguous United States, moose extend down into the Rocky Mountains. This is the Shiraz moose subspecies. And then in the Midwest, we have the Andersoni subspecies, which occurs in Minnesota and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and um, sometimes in North Dakota. And then the northeastern U.S., where we have the Anderson, uh, Americana subspecies in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and into New York, sometimes down into Massachusetts. So um, in the last uh, few years, there have been some really, really strange sightings in the uh, Jackson, Wyoming area, as well as other areas in the moose range. Um, uh, residents in Jackson have noticed moose uh, having um, uh, being whitish in color, missing large swaths of hair. Um, it's very, very strange. And so the, the National Park Service, Grand Teton National Park, has started doing surveys of moose that look like this, taking pictures and analyzing their hair loss patterns. The picture on the right shows um, how some of these pictures are analyzed, where we have the red area where the worst hair loss has occurred and the blue, some damage, and then the green, not so much damage. Of course, when you're taking random pictures like this in a large remote area, you sometimes get these unusual pictures as well. Um, I have my theories about this. I, I don't know, but this is my prediction, um, but I'll just leave it at that. That's a tangent. Um, I'm sorry, Laura, um, can you reshare your desktop? Um, your presentation seems to have disappeared. Oh, OK, let's see here. Is it working now? Oh, yes. OK. Yes, Thank you. OK, so, um, so just going back and analyzing the severity of hair loss, um, going from mild uh, to, to ghost moose, and it's kind of a, a, a scale of one to five, one being no hair loss, uh, and then two being you know five to 20% hair loss, up to 80% uh, hair loss for severe hair loss damage to the coat. And then um, greater than 80% hair loss or damage to the coat is considered uh, what we would call a ghost moose. So the culprit for um, this, we actually, I kind of had a little suspense there, but we actually know what's causing this hair loss and that's a parasite called the winter tick. And so these pictures on the right show uh, fully engorged winter ticks that um, have have fallen off moose after a winter of feeding. Um, the picture on the bottom right is a female uh, engorged uh, winter tick in her egg mass. And then the picture on the top right is um, recently hatched larva from um, winter tick larva in a laboratory setting. So this map shows the uh, winter tick uh, occurrences um, related to the moose range. So the moose, the blue circles represent the um, moose occurrences and then the green dots re um, represent known winter tick occurrences. And while some winter tick, 
The winter tick distribution is somewhat incomplete. We know that um, they've been found as far north as the Yukon in Canada. And, um, and you may notice on this map that they occur um, pretty frequently in at least the three areas where moose are found in the contiguous United States, including the Rocky Mountains, the Midwestern states like Minnesota, and then the Northeast. So this uh, diagram shows the winter tick life cycle and how it relates to climate, and um, I'll explain how it relates to climate change. So starting with the, the large black tick in the middle and going to the right, um, that this is a um, what we would consider a, a large female fully engorged tick that disengages from a moose in the spring and falls to the ground. Uh, this uh, tick will, will lay her eggs either in grass or snow, depending on the conditions. Um, and then uh, when, when the eggs hatch, they become larvae. And then later in the fall, they'll actually crawl out onto the blades of, uh, ends of blades of grass or other vegetation and stick their front legs out, uh, waiting for a moose to walk by so they can climb aboard and begin feeding in the next cycle of their um, the life cycle. Um, so they'll they'll feed on the the moose um, in, into the uh, into the fall, and then uh, we'll transition into nymphs, and then eventually become adults. And then the life spend the winter on the moose, and then the life cycle starts over. So how this relates to climate change? Um, timing of spring snowmelt can affect survival of tick abundance later in the fall. So if a lot of the female ticks fall off the, the moose in the spring, kind of in an unfavorable conditions, uh, maybe not so much so in, in the northeast where the snow doesn't get quite as deep, but maybe in areas like the Mountain West where you can have several feet of snow in the spring, particularly at higher elevations, could affect survival and successful egg laying um, and ultimately tick loads later on. And then also, as you go um, later into the fall, if uh, the timing of the first snowfall is very important. So if that snowfall comes much later in the ye in the fall, then that means um, the ticks are questing for a much longer period of time. And then moose, as they walk around and no snow, no snow, they're just going to keep accumulating ticks on their body. And so they go into the winter with these much higher tick loads. So that's typically bad for moose. At the same time, hotter and drier falls may decrease survival of winter tick larvae, which, which could be a good, a good thing. This map shows the um, population dynamics of moose throughout the, the North America. And this is an older map and older estimates. So a lot of these change from year to year. But to get the idea, you'll probably notice that there are a lot of red boxes which indicate decreasing population abundance. A notable decline has occurred in the, uh, the state of Minnesota. There were typically two um, populations in Minnesota in the past, the Northwest population and the Northeast population. The Northwest population has pretty much collapsed and the Northeast population is um, showing major signs of of decline and winter tick is certainly playing a role here as well, as well as other diseases, which I'll mention briefly in a minute. Also in the Northeast, winter tick is uh, particularly um, an issue in New Hampshire specifically. And um, some captured animals have had as many as 60,000 ticks on, on them at one time after a winter. So you can imagine these, these ticks get pretty large. The, the females can get as large as a grape. So if you have 60,000 on, on you, um, how much blood loss might occur? So paths coming out of the first winter um, can lose so much blood that they actually become anemic or go into protein shock and then die. So this is a major source of mortality in some areas of the Northeast. Now, I mentioned other factors are also at play and climate change is playing a role. For example, pathogens and parasites such as um, brainworm, which is a, a parasite that's found in white-tailed deer, 
Um, it's not lethal to deer, but as deer move farther north with um, winters becoming less severe, shorter winters, uh, deer are inter interacting more with moose within the range and then spreading this parasite and, and it is lethal to moose. So this is an issue. Heat stress has also been documented as a potential issue. Concerns are related to the fact that moose may spend more time uh, thermoregulating, uh, trying to cool themselves off rather than um, feeding and building up fat reserves for the winter. So there are a number of factors um, potentially that could be leading to some of these moose declines in addition to winter tick. So because of some of these concerns, the National Climate Adaptation Science Center has sponsored um, several studies um, related to just understanding a baseline uh, genetic diversity information, as well as um, how winter ticks may survive in different areas of the country, and then some adaptation work that I'll talk about at the end. Starting with some of the uh, molecular ecology work we've done, we teamed up with the uh, USGS Wetland and Aquatic Research Center, Dr. Margaret Hunter and Dr. Jason Ferrante, who are actually molecular ecologists who work mostly on uh, manatees in Florida, as well as Burmese pythons. Uh, we were able to collect um, a number of moose samples throughout the range in the, the lower 48, including the Rocky Mountains, Minnesota, and New Hampshire. Yes, we were able to calculate uh, genetic structure, and this wasn't too surprising. We um, each of the um, three different sampled areas represent three different subspecies, so we expected to see some genetic structure um, here. Uh, within within the Rocky Mountains, there was a little bit more structure. You may notice in the green circle, the Sarasi moose. There's a little bit more um, variation among individuals. Uh, see, noted by the pink, orange, um, and green dots. But overall, um, although we did see um, declining genetic diversity at the southernmost uh, parts of the distribution, it was not, um, there were no signs of inbreeding. So this is um, definitely a good sign given some of these declines that we've seen in certain areas. Also, so we've been working with um, the USGS Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center, Dr. Paul Cross and Troy Kozer, who's a PhD student at Mo Montana State University. Uh, they have some collaborators that have been studying potential local adaptations of winter ticks collected from both Maine and Wyoming, and, uh, which as um, preliminary results suggest that some of these um, ticks are locally adapted to different climate variables. So the, the ticks sampled in Maine did not survive really extreme uh, temperature conditions um, that the ticks from Wyoming did. And this is concerning given with warming temperatures, particularly uh, as they warm farther and farther north, how much of an issue winter ticks could become as, um, as climate warms going north into Canada and Alaska and so forth. So Paul and Troy are working on uh, microhabitat experiments um, that are specific to climate conditions in the Intermountain West. Um, they're focusing on the off-host uh, stages of ticks. So after the females fall off the moose, um, the conditions that um, they typically encounter uh, when the females uh, fall on the ground, when they lay their eggs, when the larvae hatch, and when they uh, start questing, these are um, all factors that have the potential to be um, greatly affected by different climate variables. And so they want to understand what life stages may, may be most sensitive to different climate variables. So they've set up a number of um, sampling locations around the Jackson, Wyoming, Wyoming area that represent um, the different or that are different elevations and um, land cover conditions. And within these different locations, we've set up a number, a number of replicate stations, uh, monitoring stations like the diagram shown here, where we have these wire cages filled with files. And in each file, we have an engorged female winter tick. And then it's um, fitted with a uh, temperature and relative humidity logger. 
as well as, as a snow depth stick. And then these are monitored throughout the early spring and into the summer. And each cage is wrapped with different type of coverings to um, simulate different um, emulate different uh, uh, warming conditions. And so hopefully from this experiment, this is still, um, this is ongoing. This is a, a finishing up the field season from of this now, as this fall. Um, we'll hopefully have some results and better understand uh, how ticks can survive under um, a variety of different conditions and what factors may uh, limit uh, or facilitate their um, ability to lay eggs and successfully quest and find a host for the winter. And this can also help managers better predict what uh, climate, uh, climatic and environmental factors may precipitate a good or a bad tick here. So um, kind of going back to uh, Jack Nicholson, back to the beginning, the National Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, here we work on research to help avoid some of the scary scenarios for uh, fish and wildlife. Tools like Bickley that Abby talked about can help inform climate adaptation planning for salmon and, and other fish. On the wildlife side, we have um, strategies that can help uh, moose um, uh, deal with the haunted uh, conditions related to warming and ticks. So you may be wondering, we have all of these impacts. So what actually can humans do to respond to some of these impacts? And there are kind of um, two general responses that we often uh, refer to, and one is climate mitigation, when this is the actually addressing the underlying drivers of climate change, and then climate adaptation, which, direct, which is addresses um, responses to current uh, or future impacts directly. And these are often viewed as two sides of a coin, but they're not really alternative actions. Instead, they be, should be viewed as complementary actions. Here at USGS, because we don't uh, focus on policy or regulation. We, but, um, and because adaptation, um, we know it's necessary given that uh, results, uh, several studies have um, suggested that many of these climate change impacts may already be irreversible. So climate adaptation is extremely important. And that's what we focus on here at the Climate Adaptation Science Center. So, so an example of um, climate adaptation um, for salmon, so say in the Pacific Northwest, where we have salmon coming into streams to spawn, um, one issue is that when you, with climate change, is there are all kinds of other stressors that affect salmon populations and their ability to reproduce. But if you can reduce uh, some human-caused stressors, such as habitat degradation, they may be, have more ability to respond to climate change impacts. So one climate adaptation strategy is reducing these stressors such as uh, removing upstream barriers, restoring re uh, stream flow regimes, reducing erosion. Also, we can help try to minimize exposure in streams by increasing forest cover in riparian areas to provide shade or in cases where uh, planting may not be feasible like this picture on the right, we can construct uh, artificial structures like these log jams that can provide thermal refugia and help salmon better cope with these warming streams. The moose and winter tick side, one of the best strategies to help minimize impacts of the winter tick is controlling moose densities. Wherever you have high densities of moose, which typically, typically occurs in good habitats, you're more likely going to have um, a larger number of winter ticks because where you have moose, you're going to have ticks. And so that's how managers generally respond um, to these issues to try to reduce um, tick loads. So spreading out habitats to different, so moose can kind of disperse and use different areas um, can kind of help reduce some of these issues. At the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty with identifying uh, adaptation strategies. We don't always know how climate scenarios are going to play out. We can predict or project 
but we don't know how it will play out, particularly in different environments. And um, in the Northeast, um, there's a large portion of forests that are privately owned. And so we don't know how private landowners are going to manage their lands. It's not always easy to predict. Um, some may decide to keep all their land in old growth forests. Some may want to clear it off. Some may open, provide openings which are ideal for moose. So with all this uncertainty, uh, sometimes to make adaptation decisions, we have to utilize tools like scenario planning, um, which is a tool that helps um, develop uh, a suite of plausible scenarios so managers can make decisions given there may be several plausible futures. And so we teamed up with Dr. Molly Cross at the Wildlife Conservation Society uh, to develop some scenarios for moose and winter ticks in the northeastern U.S. And two main drivers of change that we identified for this area were uh, temperature changes and then changes in forest complexity. And by forest complexity, I mean changes from um, old growth, either all old growth or all clear cut, which is uh, low forest complexity to more of a mixture, which has higher forest complexity. So under these two drivers, which are seen on the, uh, the two uh, vertical and horizontal axes, we can actually come up with four different scenarios for moose in the region. And then managers ideally can uh, develop uh, adaptation actions that might be robust under these, these different scenarios. So on the, the bottom right is one of the best case scenarios for moose where you have small temperature increases, high forest complexity, that's moose nirvana. Going in the top right corner, we have high forest complexity, but high temperature increases. That's that's a recipe for moose. That's why we call it, or ticks, I'm sorry. That's why we call it tick, tick, boom. And then on the left two um, quadrants, we have um, lower forest complexity and small and large temperature increases. So we've labeled either a slow and steady decline or a bye-bye moose. So this is just kind of a general uh, idea of, um, of some tools that we can use um, to help inform some of these adaptation decisions under climate change and dealing with some of these impacts. Thank you very much. Hi, Mitch, um, you're on mute. Sorry about that. And it would not, okay, there we go. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, Want to thank Ab Abby and Laura, that was a great talk. Um, we are now open for the question and answer portion of this lecture. Um, we have been monitoring questions and we can use some more actually. So if you like to ask a question, remember to click on the Q&A chat window. Look for the question mark in the upper right hand corner of the screen and you can submit your questions. Okay, um, question I had um, is this um, tick issue also prevalent in other animals like deer or, mo or bison or you know bighorn sheep or that type of thing? It does occur on other animals. Um, it doesn't seem to be as big of an issue and I've heard different theories why. Uh, for example, deer, uh, apparently they're social groomers so their family members will help pluck the ticks off. Um, for whatever reason, it tends to be uh, primarily a major issue on moose, as far as we know. Okay. Um, this is a first, folks. I'm not, we don't have any questions. You must have done such a great job that no one has anything else to say. Give everybody a couple of minutes here. So either folks don't have questions or the, the app isn't working. Um, 
Okay, I want to thank you. Thank you again to Abby and Laura for your talk today. And Mitch, it does look like there's one question Oops, I think okay. that came through on. Um, yeah, there is. I just saw it. Okay, working sorry, with I'm having, I'm having, I'm having multiple screen issues here. Um, question is, are, are there any efforts to work with private landowners on, on conservation? And I'll leave that to either one of you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm pretty sure there are. Uh, the, the states are probably a better um, uh, outlet to, to ask about this because I know they, they work uh, more regularly with landowners. I know when we had some workshops in New York State around the um, Adirondack uh, Park, uh, there they were definitely, there's a lot of private uh, landowners within that area and I know they they work pretty regularly with them um, but yeah I wish I wish I had that information in front of me uh, but I, I know the states do work pretty and for other species as well I know they they depend on private landowners quite a bit for um, conservation efforts such as this yeah and okay. I can I see the the there's a fish question and and also just to jump on the the landowners landowners question on the aquatic side. There are um, certain efforts th that are done at a very local scale um, where we can work with landowners to help improve aquatic habitats, particularly um, related to to farmland and um, and ranchers. And uh, relating to the spawned out salmon question, I, I would not recommend eating spawned out salmon um, once they once they enter fresh waters. Um, yeah, I, I basically I wouldn't recommend eating them once they they enter the estuaries. They they don't eat, so um, they, their bodies essentially start to decay even at that point. Okay, um, I want to thank Abby and Laura again for your talk and answering the few questions we did get from the audience. Um, also, want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, this talk will be available later for on-demand viewing at our website at www.usgs.gov slash PLS. We do hope you come back again next month for our talk on Yellowstone volcanism on November 18th at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Until then, thank you again for joining us and have a good night. Happy Halloween. And happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, everybody.